All right, so we're at week six of the Lab Values class, and I hope that you are finding information that's helping you in clinic or prepare for clinic. This week we'll be talking about gastrointestinal system, and this lecture will actually go over um, two sessions. And so we'll get through part of the content today, and then if you'll have those notes, when you watch the lecture for next week, I'll finish um, with the liver function test and then start another short little piece on chemistry profiles. So this week we're going to fo uh, focus on the esophagus, we'll focus on the gallbladder, the pancreas, and then next week you'll do the liver. So just a quick review to start with, and I hope that you're keeping up on your quizzes and that you remember you have two attempts for each quiz. If you don't get the grade that you like on the first one, take it again, and you, you always have nothing to lose because I record your highest score. So if you think of the gastrointestinal system, we're going to be looking at evaluation of the esophagus and how things move into the stomach. There's a sphincter that closes once food moves from the esophagus to the stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter. There's a second sphincter when food exits from the stomach and enters the jejunum and ileum, um, the portions of the small intestine. And then our final place, the rectum, or excuse me, the colon, and then the rectum. So we're going to be looking at those kinds of systems. We'll also add in, as I mentioned, function of the liver. Sitting right under the liver is the gallbladder. Under the stomach, on the left side of your body, is um, your little pancreas. And so we'll look at all of those systems as we go through the next two weeks. So what symptoms would cause us to suspect gastrointestinal problems? I want you to think about that question for just a little bit. And if you have your notes in front of you, I've added in quite a list there. Well, I guess I better answer those questions, huh? So if someone had a problem with difficulty with bowel movements, if they had chronic diarrhea, if they had especially if they're not having bowel movements and they're vomiting, and especially if that vomit is a bright yellow or a green, um, that is billy, bilious vomit, and that would mean that maybe they have an intestinal blockage, and that would be a life-threatening event. Uh, if you have blood in stool, if it enters up high in the gastrointestinal system, like from a bleeding ulcer, it will make your stool, your bowel movement, black and tarry. So if someone has black and tarry stools, we think about gastrointestinal bleeding. If you have bright red blood, that could mean that you have something wrong with your colon or maybe just something simple like hemorrhoids, which would be the blood is entering just before the stool or as the stool passes. We'll talk about polyps and diverticuli that can happen inside the colon. We're going to talk about um, some things that happen in the peritoneal cavity called ascites, where we have an accumulation of fluid. If someone has a bad taste in their mouth when they wake up after sleeping, or if they have a lot of heartburn, maybe they have problems with reflux. And um, that reflux sensation can sometimes cause what we might think of as cardiac pain, too. So because the esophagus overlies the heart, sometimes we have to rule out or rule in cardiac abnormalities when we're dealing with problems like reflux. Okay, so let's look at some tests we might do. And we're going to start with a very non-invasive test. This is something that if you went to a healthcare screening, they might give out as you go through the different um, booths. This is something that you could complete in, in your home. What you're going to do is take a little sample of your fecal matter and spread it on a film. And then you're going to close that sheet. And when it gets back to the place uh, that you send it to, so for example, I know that one of the, the local TV channels did colon screening. Uh, looking for blood in your stool is one way to check for colon cancer. And colorectal cancer is one of the three most deadly types of cancer in both men and women. And so it's important that we screen for it and we identify patients who have problems with it. So they sent these out. You could request one by mail. You completed it by adding your fecal matter. And there's little flaps that close so it gets protected. 
it went back to the hospital and the hospital or the clinic then would add the reagent or the thing that makes it develop. This is going to show them that they did the test correctly and if it shows blue on the sample piece, the one that has your bowel movement, it would mean that you have blood present in your stool. And so one of these sides is going to say, yes, we did the test correctly. That lets me know it worked, kind of like a pregnancy test where you get one thing that tells you the results and one little piece that tells you if you did the test correctly. Um, it would then look for that blood in a person's bowel movement, and that could indicate that they have something like a bleeding ulcer, but it could also mean they have something like colon cancer. So occult blood or stool guaiac are two names for the same test. Occult means hidden, so I can't always notice that my stools are black and tarry, but maybe there still is blood in them, and so you would check. Next, we move to a condition called esophageal varices, and it kind of ties in with that stool guaiac because this might be a reason that someone has blood entering their digestive tract. Esophageal varices is going to be most commonly seen in people who uh, have problems with their liver, the main one being um, a nice swollen or scarred liver. And that could be due to hepatitis. It could also be due to cirrhosis. And because the most common cause of cirrhosis is alcoholism, we might see this condition most prominently in patients who have a history of alcoholism. What happens in esophageal varices is, is that those veins that lie close to the surface of the esophagus become enlarged and distended. And the reason that they become distended is because the blood flow through that liver is not as effective as it should be, so it backs up. So I give you a case study here, and I'll let you read your screen. So it's obviously not normal for someone to vomit up a cup of red blood, and we do worry about the color. Red usually means that it's been exposed to air and those uh, hemoglobin molecules have taken up oxygen, or it could also mean that you're bleeding from an artery instead of a vein, and that would definitely be more concerning. So she vomits up some blood. That sounds like it's coming from the digestive tract. And then blood tests show that she does have abnormal liver function studies. She hadn't had a history of liver disease like hepatitis, but she does have evidently an alcohol problem. I think I would call that a pretty profound alcohol problem. So here's what esophageal varices would look like. Normally when we look at the esophagus, and this is using a scope, and gastroscopy, so when we use this oscopy term, it's using a scope. We did cystoscopy when we looked at the bladder. We're going to do bronchoscopy when we look at the lungs. And now gastroscopy, we're looking at the gastrointestinal system. Or my favorite word of all times is esophagastroduodenoscopy. So think what they're looking at there. Esopho, they're looking at the esophagus. Gastro, they're looking at the stomach duodenoscopy, so they're going into the duodenum or duodenum, depending on which anatomy and physiology professor you had. And so it's a scope that would be long enough to do all those things. If I just needed to study your esophagus, I wouldn't need a scope that was as long as that one. So we're looking at this, and normally it should just be smooth, and we shouldn't see a lot of dilated blood vessels. But in the case of problems with your liver and blood flow through the liver becomes not quite what it should be. We have those veins filling with blood. And remember, arteries are thick-walled. They're meant to hold pressures, but, are, but veins are not. So those veins start to dilate, and then we worry that they start to rupture. And as you can imagine, if these rupture, blood would then enter the gastrointestinal system. So esophageal varices, takeaway points would be, it might be a patient who complains of black tarry stools. It may be someone who, like our case study patient, is vomiting blood. It's usually seen in someone who has a history of liver disease caused by alcoholism, but that is not the only cause of cirrhosis. So kind of be careful with making that overall global assumption. The next thing we'll move on to is test to look for gastroesophageal reflux disease, or we always shorten things in medicine to just their abbreviation, so GERD. And if you watch commercials, you know that a fairly large percent of the population has this problem. It's when stomach contents enter into the esophagus. 
and the pH of the stomach. Do you remember from anatomy and physiology what the pH of the stomach was? Well, on that pH scale, 7 was considered neutral, and things less than 7 were acid, and things greater than 7 were alkaline. And the pH of the stomach is 1 to 2, so very acidic. The esophagus is not meant to have that strong of an acid in it. The pH of the esophagus is more like a 5 or a 6, depending on which foods you've eaten. And so while the lining of the stomach is set up to take that strong pH of the stomach, the esophagus is not. So this picture shows that lower esophageal sphincter. It used to be called the cardiac sphincter, but you can imagine that was very confusing to patients when they thought they came in with reflux and pretty soon somebody was talking about cardiac. And even lay people know that means heart. So it's been renamed the lower esophageal sphincter. If I have a problem with that not closing um, efficiently or it doesn't close at a sufficient pressure, I can have food move from my stomach into my esophagus. And that by its nature is GERD. So ways that we could diagnose that, we could look with a scope and we could look at the lining of the esophagus. We could look at the sphincter itself. So here's the sphincter that normally closed, that lower esophageal sphincter, and here's one that did not close completely. And especially when this person laid down, they would have a problem with reflux. You can imagine that reflux is going to be worse if I'm a person who lays down all the time like a little baby. It would definitely be worse than someone who stands upright most of the day. Barrett's esophagus is the concern that we have in someone who has repetitive episodes of GERD. And Barrett's esophagus is a precursor, or we watch it because it may turn into cancer. And this picture shows two conditions. It shows the Barrett's esophagus, which is uh, damage occurring to that area right above the lower esophageal sphincter. So the cells would become red, they would become irritated, and again we worry because it may then lead to an esophageal cancer. It also shows a hiatal hernia, where a portion of the contents which should be in the peritoneal cavity have moved up into the thoracic cavity. So this portion of the stomach should be down below the diaphragm. A uh, hiatal hernia could be a portion of the intestine that's herniated up into the thoracic cavity. It could be just like this picture, where they have a portion of their stomach that's herniated up into the thoracic cavity. And as you can imagine, when this person swallows food, this would almost act like a little tiny pouch that's going to fill up pretty quickly, and it would make sense then that they're going to reflux up into that esophagus area. And so it may fix this person's reflux if we fix their hernia. There are some other types of hernias mentioned in your notes, and we talked about a hiatal hernia. This is an inguinal hernia. And we typically think of this only happening in males because there's the one, they are the ones with the scrotum. And, um, but females also have an inguinal canal. You can have a weak, you have a weak spot here. And so intestines can herniate down into the scrotum. That can be uncomfortable, but the big concern would be that this could get twisted and then lose blood flow through it. And so we worry if you have an inguinal hernia, it's fairly easy to reduce. But the more that it happens, that pathway becomes larger and larger. Perhaps more and more intestine descends. And the big concern would be if we have a strangulated hernia, one that's twisted and then has a blockage of blood flow to it. So an inguinal hernia. Uh, in your notes, it also talks about, um, I guess I didn't put in, but you could have an umbilical hernia, one that occurs at your umbilicus or your belly button because those are weak spots. This is another test that could be used to look for gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's the pH probe study. And this is where that little pH probe is, the little piece that's doing measuring. There's a proximal one and opening, and then there's a distal opening too. Um, this would not be put in twisted and knotted like this, of course. It's just twisted so that you can see the end of it. But it would be um, inserted usually through the person's nose. They could even be awake while this pH probe study is done. They may be ambulatory. They may be walking around. We usually monitor them for a few hours, maybe 6 to 12 hours. This could be done in adults. It could be done in infants. 
And what we're going to do is have it record data. And we get a record then from, let's orient ourselves to the table. We have the green, which is the proximal piece of the esophageal probe. And the distal portion, and I wish I had that min and black pin because I called this proximal and this is really the distal. That would make sense, huh? Because we're inserting it. There would be a probe that sits just above the esophagus and one that sits, um, this one sits just above the esophagus and then the other one would be higher in the esophagus. So we've got one just above that esophageal sphincter, that lower esophageal sphincter, and this shows the pH. And we can see that that distal probe, and sometimes even the proximal one, is dropping fairly significantly. And the closer it becomes to that one or twos, we know that that's uh, probably most likely contents from the stomach coming up into the esophagus. The person could then code in little things or the healthcare provider could code in little things to say are they supine are they laying down so here they were laying down here they ate a meal here they were postprandial after a meal and then the person could code in things like coughing or belching so that you could see what events on the outside of the patient were corresponding with those things that the probes are measuring so this person did have fairly significant reflux as evidenced by those pH drops and they would probably have symptoms of heartburn. They didn't record any of those, but they did have coughing. So maybe it's even that they're aspirating some of that abdominal contents, which could lead to pneumonia or there's a strong link between people who have reflux. They then end up with asthma. Um, and it's really that the stomach contents is irritating when they aspirate that into the lungs, it irritates those airways and makes them inflamed and, and simulates an asthma type process. So ways to check were for reflux. We could do fancy tests like esophageal probe. We could just have the person take medication that treats reflux and if they get better, we've made our diagnosis. So isn't it interesting that there's as many lab tests as we have but there are some situations where it may be enough just to treat the person as if that's what they have. And if they get bitter, we make the assumption that, yes, that diagnosis was correct. And this is a fairly common one of those that we don't bring everybody who we think has GERD in and do a pH probe study or an esophagoscopy study. We may just treat them as if they do. And if they get better, we say that's what you had. Here's a study that could be done to look for reflux, but it could also, it's also um, used to look for contents going through the esophagus to see if there's narrowed areas. If it were called the swallow study, we would then just be focusing on the esophagus and looking for that peristalsis that should occur. If we call it an upper GI or a barium swallow, not a swallow study, then we're focusing on the upper gastrointestinal system, meaning that lower esophageal sphincter. So we do this test. As you can imagine, the pH probe study, we do them in babies, but they're not as diagnostic because think of what babies do. If you have an upset stomach, in the olden days, the remedy was to either make you a little bicarbonate of soda drink, so you'd add some bicarb to water and drink it, and that neutralized the acid or you drink milk, which neutralize the acid. And if you think about it, babies drink milk all the time. And so they may not, we may not see these profound acid changes because they have milk in their stomach most of the time, which would not let the pH be that um, significantly different. So we take babies down to fluoroscopy where they take a moving x-ray. And instead of having the baby swallow the contrast media, if we're studying the stomach and the lower esophageal sphincter, we're going to put a tube in their nose or mouth, put it down into the stomach, put the contrast media or the barium into the stomach, and then withdraw that catheter. And we look for any flashback of that fluid that should stay in the stomach coming back up into the esophagus. And that would, by um, the changes that occurred, mean that the patient has reflux. So we're looking at this person's esophagus. We could look for narrowed areas. We could look for areas where they um, maybe complain of difficulty swallowing. We could look at the stomach lining. And in fact, the most common reason for doing an up your GI study is to look for ulcers of the stomach. So if someone has an upper GI, 
It may be that we're looking at the stomach or we're looking at the esophagus. And let me kind of get to, I think I'm pretty much just following exactly with your notes. So it says this study is frequently done to look for ulcers, but it could also check for those motility disorders, things that are impacting um, the peristalsis of the esophagus. We have occasionally done these on patients and then diagnosed a tumor. You remember that you have lymph nodes in your necks. If I get a large lymph node, it might compress the esophagus. And maybe I couldn't feel it from the outside. Maybe it's more internal into my mediastinal area, the middle part of my chest under my sternum. So maybe that's where that large lymph node is that's growing and pressing on my esophagus and making it difficult for me to swallow. Now we move to a lower GI. So you can imagine that if we swallow the other one, we're going to have to shoot this one up into the lower, into that colon area primarily. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to have you do a regime that will clear out your colon. You'll be on some things that do make you kind of have frequent bowel movements so that you can clear that fecal matter out before this test is done, ideally. Then they're going to put a tube in your rectum, and it has a cuff that blows up to kind of hold it in place. And we're going to inject contrast media, the barium, up into your colon. So can you see how nicely, though, you can see the lining of this person's colon? So this test would be done to look for the shape of the colon, the surface of the colon lining, we're looking for polyps and diverticuli, things that might indicate that you have a colon cancer. Things that might explain why you're having difficulty having bowel movements. If you had a partial blockage, we wouldn't want to just put up contrast media um, because that barium can settle and almost become like a cement. We want to have an expectation if we put barium in that we can get it out. So if we think that you have an, a blockage, we're going to use a much thinner type of contrast media, but it won't let us see the lining of those that colon or the upper GI as well as this one will. Okay, so with this then, we took the person to fluoroscopy. They're on a bed that will move around so that we could move this dye so that it coats every surface of your intestine. And the lower GI then would be mainly to look for a person who's had those black tarry stools possibly, a person who's had blood in their stool a person who has had difficulty having bowel movements we might do a lower GI. What if we took a scope? And so we had a scope come from the up or the top part down. Now we can go from the rectum in. Uh, we have sigmoid scope, sigmoidoscopy, or we have just a colonoscopy. So we remember that one's going to be longer than the other one. And with this procedure then, we're going to have the person laying on a bed with their bottom up in the air, so kind of an unnatural position to be put in. We're going to give them some medication so that they feel more comfortable. Um, we're going to do a conscious, conscious sedation so that they can still move if we need them to move. But this would be the screening test, the best test to check for colon cancer. So during a colonoscopy, we're putting that scope up into their rectum. And when we do the scope procedure, just like when we talked about the bladder, we could do biopsies through that. We could do small surgical procedures. There are lasers that can work with these instruments. So if we needed to remove a tumor, we could maybe um, cut it off with a laser that would seal the bleeding and then remove that tumor using those little forceps that we can pass through the instrument. Um, what else did I want to do here? There are virtual colonoscopies, and those are done one of two ways. We can give you contrast. The contrast lets us see soft tissues on an x-ray, where normally we wouldn't see those. That's why we need to put some sort of contrast in you, and the contrast we usually used was called barium. We can do a CAT scan. And that will give us a 3D picture of your colon, where your KUB radiograph, like this one, only gives us a two-dimensional view. So we could do a helical CAT scan and have you swallow the barium or have it come up your rectum. And that would be a virtual colonoscopy. If we find something, we can't fix it, though. The advantage of this one is the physician could look carefully at every surface of your colon, 
And the best part is if they find a tumor or something, a little polyp, a little growth, they could biopsy it right then so that we could get the results back. If they were to find something with a virtual colonoscopy, then you might still have to come in for a real colonoscopy. The last thing I want to say about this is there's one other type of virtual colonoscopy. It's a small camera that's been put inside a pill, and I'm not making this up. You swallow that pill, and it goes through your intestinal tract, and it takes pictures. And you can imagine that that camera is not spinning all the time, so it won't catch every surface of your intestines. But that's another type of virtual colonoscopy. Now, how do you think they get the camera so that they can develop it? You're right. The person would have to be catching their bowel movements and watching for that camera to come through. Wouldn't that be fun? And then they'll take it in for developing. Okay, diverticulitis. This is a condition where if I were in the intestine, it would look like a little cave or a pouch. So... If I look at this person's lining of their colon, I can see these little dilations which represent diverticuli. And itis, if you have medical terminology, or remember means inflammation or infection. So diverticulitis, I have diverticuli and they have become inflamed. Diverticulosis is the term that would tell you I have diverticulitis. Or excuse me, I have diverticuli. So which one's worse of those? The diverticulitis would be worse than diverticulosis. So I can have these, and if I had a lot of them, you can see it wouldn't be practical to go in and remove every single one of those. And the way they'd remove them is probably to suture them closed, or we have medical glue. We could kind of glue these little pouches shut. The concern is when we have body fluids of any kind that don't drain, they're at risk for becoming infected. So as you can imagine, when this person produces fecal matter, you have contents in your fecal matter that don't break down very well, things like corn or seeds. Those are more likely to become lodged in these little diverticuli, these little pouches, and then those might become infected, and that might lead to more dilation. That infection process usually damages that lining a little bit more, and so we have this spread, and the concern would be eventually, what if my bowel ruptured, and those bacteria that are found in my digestive tract might move then into the peritoneum, which should be sterile. And I could end up with a really bad infection. So with diverticuli, sometimes we have people who are asked to avoid seeds. There's kind of a mixed signal right now in the research as far as whether that's really necessary. But it's something they should watch for. The patient who has diverticuli would watch closely for symptoms of pain in their bowel that might indicate this has progressed to a blockage or it's progressed to an inflammation, the diverticulitis, and then they would be put on antibiotics and watched. A polyp, on the other hand, is if I were standing in the intestine, it would look like a tumor or a wart coming into the center, moving towards the center of that intestine. Okay, so a polyp could be a normal benign process. It could just be an area that got irritated and the body thought, okay, if I produce more tissue there, I can kind of protect it. A polyp could also become cancerous, um, and it could be cancer, and that's why it grew in the first place. So we worry about, just like we worried any time body fluids don't drain like they should, they're at risk for becoming infected. Anytime you constantly irritate a body tissue, it's at risk for becoming cancerous. So it explains why if I had a mole on my face and I was a man and every time I shave, I irritated that area, the doctor might want me to have that mole removed because it's at risk for becoming cancerous. Anytime we constantly irritate something, there's always a potential that the cells will change to an abnormal cell type and become cancerous. So the, the worry here is as food moves by this polyp, as your digestive materials move by it and irritate it, that could cause it to become cancerous if it didn't start that way in the first place. Um, the other thing that we worry about is these could grow large enough that they could block the intestine. And they're getting irritated every time something comes by them, so they would cause a little bit of bleeding. And thus, that's why we might see blood on the stool guaiac if you had colon cancer. So polyps could be removed. 
they probably should be removed and then biopsied if we find them to see if they're cancerous or just benign. Okay, the next thing we move to is pancreas. And just a reminder that the pancreatic duct and the gallbladder, this gallbladder is just a little potential kind of fluid holder. It's going to hold waste product. Do you remember your pancreas, what it's doing in the body? It's producing digestive enzymes, and it makes sense then it would release those digestive enzymes through the bile duct into your small intestine. We've got waste products coming from the gallbladder into that common bile duct, and we also have waste products from the liver coming to that common bile duct. So if something blocked that common bile duct, like a stone from your gallbladder, what will the pancreas digest? Because it will still release those enzymes. Well, it would start to digest itself. And so that could become a patient, or that could have, cause a patient to become very, very ill, is if they have pancreatitis. And the most common thing to cause pancreatitis would be a blockage. And the most common thing to cause a blockage would be a gallstone. And we can't just call them gallstones in medicine. We have to use the fancy word. That would be cholelithiasis. So just like we had kidney stones, nephrolithiasis, now we have cholei refers to the gallbladder. If somebody had a lap cholei, they had a laparoscopic remover of their gallbladder, a lap cholei. So if you have the pancreas enzymes elevated, we're going to worry that maybe you have gallbladder problems until proven otherwise. That's the relationship. So pancreatitis, like the name implies, is an inflammation of the pancreas. The most common thing to cause problems with your pancreas is gallstones or liver problems. Alcoholism may be causing that scar tissue to the liver. If pancreatitis is diagnosed, we're going to assume that the cause is stones until proven otherwise. So you don't just have one rarely without having the other one. And the role of the pancreas was to secrete those digestive enzymes. And so we could measure those digestive enzymes as an indicator of function of the pancreas. Serum amylase is a test that we take and we measure it on your blood. So we're going to take a blood sample. It can also be measured in your urine, but probably the most common way I see it done is on your blood. And it's an enzyme that's going to be released into the blood in higher levels when you have damage to your pancreas. Serum amylase is not just specific to the pancreas, though. It's also found in some glands, glands called your parotid glands, and they're kind of um, on, by the side of your neck. So it's not elevations in serum amylase are not always an indicator that you may have problems with your pancreas. They may also indicate you have problems with your parotid glands. But if someone came in complaining of right upper quadrant pain or left upper quadrant pain, we might check pancreas function. Okay, going back to that common bile duct, can you see how if I blocked this common bile duct, that could cause pancreatic problems. In your notes, huh, I wonder how come I got amylase in there but not lipase. On your notes, I have it. The other test for pancreas function is to do a serum lipase. And a serum lipase this one is pancreatic specific because that's the place where this enzyme comes from. It's what helps break fat down in, your, in the foods that you eat. So if I have a problem not having enough lipase go into my body, right? you're going to remember that I don't have a slide for serum lipase for some reason it got lost. If I don't have enough, I might have fatty stools, ones that are really stinky and really bulky instead of having that be able to move into my body. Um, other tests of pancreatic function mentioned in your notes, we can do a fecal fat study. We can do an ultrasound of your pancreas. We could do a biopsy of your pancreas. So to wrap up this content information, what I'm going to do is remind you that we looked at studies that could evaluate the esophagus. We looked at studies that could evaluate your upper and lower GI. We looked at studies that could evaluate the function of the pancreas, specifically serum amylase and serum lipase and possibly fecal fat studies.
If you have pancreatitis, we would expect that your serum amylase and lipase levels would elevate. If your serum amylase levels elevate, but your serum lipase levels do not, then the problem is probably your parotid glands, and they can get infected, and they can actually have stones that block them. All right, I will save the remaining content so that this lecture doesn't go too long. I'll save the remaining content on liver function to talk about next time. So you can anticipate that and sit on the edge of your seat waiting for part two. Let me just double check really quick. See, look at all this fun stuff coming. So turn in next week or tune in next week and we'll continue with this lecture. And let me stop this recording. Oh, I've only gone 35 minutes. Well, I think that will be okay for this time. You know what? Let me keep going because we can get through a little bit of this and then maybe we'll just have liver function tests to do. Okay, so let me do this one. We've already talked about how cirrhosis might cause esophageal varices. Just when you thought you were done, I changed things. Uh, the first stage in that process would be that you have a fatty liver. And if you have someone who's overweight or obese, they could be causing liver damage just because the liver gets put in a layer of fat. They could have increased liver enzymes, meaning there's damage to the liver, and not even know it unless they have those measured. So that's one risk of being overweight is to have a fatty liver. If that persists, that can cause the liver to start to fail, and there will be scar tissue that forms to try and protect the liver. That scar tissue could be reversible at some point, but if it continues, it destroys the connective tissue and that connective tissue, or there's a, a replace with connective tissue, and that would lead to an irreversible process called cirrhosis. So the most common cause of cirrhosis will be alcoholism. There are other causes like hepatitis, um, chronic inflammation, the fatty um, damage to the liver could cause that eventually. And once we get to that point, it would be irreversible. When we have a damage to the liver, it not only affects the esophagus, it starts to affect fluid through other blood vessels that are leading into that uh, liver as well. And so that fluid looks for a place to go, and it might end up in the peritoneal cavity, and we call that condition ascites. So as you can imagine, this person's abdomen is extremely swollen. If you press on that, it might be soft, and you would think fluid would be soft, but they could have so much fluid that that abdomen could be rock hard. You could feel it and barely be able to push it all on it because there's so much fluid there. It makes sense that we could just take a needle and drain off this fluid, but that would be treating the symptom and not the cause. So the most common cause of ascites is a problem with the liver. If we have someone who presents with ascites, we know they probably have something wrong with their liver. The most common thing to have wrong with their liver would be cirrhosis. So it's not to say we won't remove some of the fluid. Can you imagine how difficult it makes it to breathe? Your bladder wouldn't have much room. It can become so tight that you actually start to have skin lesions because the skin tissue over this abdomen is not receiving enough blood flow through it. When we take a CAT scan, they actually put this person with their belly down. Normally, the person's laying on their back. This one's reversed. So they had the person lay down. They took a picture, and normally your liver should come all the way out to this bottom of your rib cage. They have this much fluid that's loose in their peritoneal cavity. We might take a sample of that just to see if it's infected fluid or if it's um, just serous fluid that would be sterile, meaning that we just have that problem with fluid backup. This person's liver, then, we might look at it to see if there's increased densities, and it actually doesn't look that bad. So they're doing an abdominal tap or a paracentesis where they remove some of the fluid. Here it doesn't look like they've got anything yet, does it? They just clean the skin and put in a needle. They might leave a kind that they can leave in place if they're going to drain that fluid off for a longer period. Other things that besides ascites that might indicate a person has problems with their liver, one of those is jaundice. And jaundice is that yellow discoloration. They usually 
the reason we usually point it out in the eyes is typically jaundice starts from the top of your head and works downwards. So if you know a little baby that's had jaundice, we could evaluate how ill they are based on how far down that yellow discoloration affects. And if it's just, you know, maybe to their chin area, they probably have an early onset of jaundice so we can catch it quickly and hopefully reverse it. Jaundice is caused when your body can't get rid of bilirubin and the organ that's responsible for getting rid of that bilirubin is your liver in conjunction with your gallbladder. It comes out in your fecal matter and it comes out in your urine. And so when we have babies on bilirubin lights or when we have um, patients who are being treated with certain medications that can increase bilirubin excretion, their bowel movements could become more yellowish or more clay colored, kind of a lighter color. Their urine becomes much more dark as it has a lot of that bilirubin in it. And your liver converts bilirubin from its bad form, the indirect form, to its good form, the direct. Or the bad form is unconjugated bilirubin. It helps convert it to the, the form that your body can more easily get rid of, conjugated bilirubin. Bilirubin is a waste product um, that's generally caused when red blood cells break down. And so if I had a lot of bruising, it may be that I become jaundiced just because my body hasn't had time to get rid of that waste product. But jaundice could mean I have problems with my liver. We can do ultrasounds of the liver. So we're seeing the outline of the kidney. And we're seeing this big liver above it. There are different lobes of the liver that we could examine. And with ultrasound, we can study shape and size and density. We could look at the veins of the liver, the portal veins. And portal hypertension is something that would lead to ascites or that could lead to the fluid in the peritoneal cavity. It could also lead to esophageal varices, a dilation of those veins of the esophagus or the ones that are right next to the esophagus, not the veins of the esophagus. Okay, now I'll really stop. But these will be the things we'll start with next time is what blood tests could we do to look at liver function. Okay, I won't drag it out any longer. We'll stop it now.